If you see a teen or adult suddenly collapse, it's important to act fast. Helping to save a life is easier than you might think. Just start hands-only CPR. The first step is to send someone to call 911 or call 911 yourself. Then get directly over the victim. Put the heel of one hand in the center of the chest, then put your other hand on top of the first. Then push hard and fast in the center of the chest until help arrives. It's important to push, giving 100 to 120 compressions per minute, which is about the same tempo as the song Stayin' Alive. Let's hope you never have to use hands-only CPR. But if you see a teen or adult suddenly collapse, don't be afraid to try it. Remember, call 911, then push hard and fast in the center of the chest until help arrives. Your actions can help save a life. My name is Tanya Shields. I'm EMS coordinator here at Goshen Hospital in Goshen, Indiana. Um, I have been a CPR instructor for 19 years, and I've seen many changes that have happened over the years. As we know, and we've learned over, the, especially the last year, science drives our healthcare, and we're always learning new things. And one of the things that we've learned recently with um, CPR is that we want individuals to be able to participate out in the community and really push on that chest so that we can keep the blood moving through the body. One of the questions I've had many times over the years has been, well, how do I know when to do CPR? The simplest answer is if you're with somebody that collapses and you see that they're not breathing, just two simple processes will help that person. Call 911 right away because paramedics will be on their way to assist you. Most times they're with you within about six minutes in most areas. At that time, you can start pushing on the chest right in the center with two hands. You want to go hard and fast. The reason we're doing that is because we want to keep that heart pumping. The longer we keep that heart pumping, that means the blood moves. The blood still carries oxygen on those red blood cells. So oxygen still moves throughout the body. So we keep our brain perfused with oxygenated blood and all our other vital organs as well. We really want to save that tissue life so that once the paramedics arrive and they can transfer that patient, we have better outcomes. What we do know is when individuals suffer from a lack of oxygen to their brain, our brain tissue death starts within four to six minutes. So we really want to save that tissue. And I've probably heard it a hundred times in my healthcare career, time is tissue. And so we want to make sure we keep it perfor or perfused, excuse me. So in doing that and doing those hard, fast compressions, we're actually helping that person. Um, we talk about the tissue death. We talk about um, perfusing of the brain. If we have that happening, once that patient arrives at a hospital, they are able to start doing additional steps to help hopefully save that person's life. Those first two minutes that we have with a person is so important. The sad thing that we do see with statistics, 85% at least of cardiac arrest happen within our own home. So that means the loved one that you're sitting next to, that you're going to go home to this evening, that you're going to see maybe grandma or grandpa this week because you got your COVID vaccine and you can finally see them. Those individuals, we want to be able to assist them if we see them collapse. We love them. We want them to be with us as much as possible. So in that case, doing those two simple steps of calling 911 and doing hard and fast compressions right in the center of the chest is going to help for that person, again, for that perfusion that we see. I've been asked before, well, how do I know that I'm doing it correctly? Well, um, the best answer to that is if you're pushing at a tempo of 100 to 120 beats per minute, and we've oftentimes heard the slogan of staying alive by the Bee Gees, because I think that's one great song for every generation to know, um, we can see that that progress with that patient. We know we're going the right tempo um, for that patient. 
knowing how long to do it, you want to do it as long as you possibly can until the ambulance arrives for that patient. If you yourself starts to feel exhausted, if you start to feel chest pain or trouble breathing, then we do want you to stop and then resume as you can for that patient that you're working on or that loved one that you're working on um, for those individuals. So when you do have infants and children, if you um, are in an unfortunate circumstance that that is the individual that has collapsed, you want to still do that pushing hard, pushing fast for them. However, kind of a little trick, if you will, of the trade, the smaller the body gets, the less of your hands you want to use. So when we talk about an adult, an adult would be puberty and older. So those individuals were going to use two hands, one hand on top of the other. When you're looking at a child, we're talking the age of one to puberty. And so for those children, you only want to use one hand, the heel of one hand, same spot, center of the chest. And then when you have infants, we want to use two fingers again, center of the chest, hard and fast. Uh, we do get the questions about respirations. Currently, with COVID pandemic, um, things have changed a little bit. So we don't necessarily want you breathing right on that person because we do have those risk of transmission of COVID. So again, just pushing on the chest keeps that blood moving and keeps the tissues of the body perfused with oxygen. So again, we have a greater chance that once paramedics arrive and they start doing additional um, steps for a revival of that patient, there's a greater chance it's going to work um, for those patients. So we can do CPR without doing those respirations. Again, I can't emphasize enough the importance of just doing the chest compressions. If you're walking down the local grocery store, maybe it be Kroger or Walmart, um, and you see someone around you collapse, um, you definitely want to make sure the scene is safe first. So you don't ever want to just run up to an individual not really having any idea of what you're running into. Um, so just make sure you're aware of your surroundings. You know, is there anything that, um, you know, did they slip and fall in water that you may slip and fall in? Um, is there, unfortunately, we hate to say this, but is there a mass shooter somewhere? Um, something of that nature. So make sure that you are safe yourself. Approach the person, ask them, say, hey, hey, are you okay? Tap their shoulders, see if they respond. If they do not, call 911. That is the most important thing that you should do. And it's always the, the second step after you know that they're unresponsive. Um, with that being said, if they are breathing, um, go ahead, roll them to their side. The left side is best, um, just has to do with the anatomy of the body. It's less stress on the heart, less stress on the stomach. Um, and then stay with that person until the ambulance arrives. If that person stops breathing, you can roll them to their back. You can start that hands-only CPR, um, but hopefully they'll remain breathing. They may even wake up as you're with them. And so then you can maybe get some basic information to provide the ambulance for their arrival. So you could ask the person, what's their name? Do they take any medications? Um, do they have any allergies? That's all very important information that ambulance provider is going to ask once they arrive.